Hello and welcome to the course series uh, Basic Cognitive Processes. I am Dr. Arik Verma from IIT Kanpur. Uh, we are still talking about various approaches to visual perception. Uh, today we will talk about David Marr's theory of uh, perception which is uh, more commonly known as the 2.5D uh, sketch approach. Okay. Uh, before we move further, let me quote David Marr uh, from one of his papers in 1982 and he says, uh, he was basically talking about uh, how Gibson had approached perception and this quotation is in that reference. Uh, so, he says, the detection of physical invariants like image surfaces is exactly and precisely an information processing problem uh, in modern terminology. And second, uh, Gibson vastly underrated the sheer difficulty of such detection. Detecting physical invariants is just as difficult uh, as Gibson feared, but nevertheless we can do it. And the only way to understand how is to treat this as an information processing problem. Uh, now you see David Marr is basically, uh, you know, talking more about a computational approach to perception. He is basically talking about treating this problem of perception as a problem of uh, information processing. Okay, how do you really take up information from this external world, how do you work upon it and how does that or say for example, how does that information lead to the end product that is perception. That is pretty much what David Marr is talked about and we will discuss that in duty in enough detail in today's lecture. Now, while Gibson identified the need for invariance, you have seen horizontal ratio relation and you have seen uh, textures of surfaces, you have seen the uh, thing of flow and all. Uh, while Gibson identified the need for invariance for solving the problem of visual perception, he does not really specify the possible mechanisms of how this information has to be picked up from these invariants. He says, if you uh, remember the last lecture, uh, you know, depending upon these sizes, etc., we can get information, uh, but he does not really say how are we doing that. He says, info, uh, you know, you do uh, look at the surfaces, uh, whether the width is uh, smaller or larger and you can make out whether the surface is receding or uh, you know, proceeding, uh, but uh, how is this exactly done is not what uh, Gibson really talks about. So, to address this gap about, you know, how this process has to be done, uh, a particular theory was uh, needed that attempted to explain how these processes will be done, how does the brain take up information, uh, you know, sensed by the eyes and turn it into an accurate internal representation of the surrounding world. Such a theory was put forward by David Marr. Uh, before we move uh, into more detail about Marr, let me point out a couple of uh, commonalities between Gibson's and Marr's approaches. Uh, like Gibson, Marr also suggested that the information from the senses is sufficient to allow perception to occur. Marr adopted an information processing approach in which the processes responsible for analyzing the retinal image were central. So, he is again saying uh, light from the external world falling on the retina is the primary source of information and this is the starting point of perception and this is how perception is supposed to be built. Mars theory is therefore also strongly bottom up if you remember the distinction between top down and bottom up approaches mentioned in the last lecture in that it sees the retinal image as the starting point of perception and also explores how this image might be analyzed in order to produce a description of the environment. Note that Marr is not really concerned about perception for action, rather he is concerned about perception for recognition or perception that is meant to build the description of the world. Marr basically saw the analysis of the retinal image in four distinct stages, uh, within each stage taking the output of the previous one and performing a new analysis. So, it is basically an incremental process of perception that Marr will talk about. He will say uh, something happens in the first stage, then uh, where the output is uh, processed further in the second stage and so on and so forth. Let us have a brief look at these uh, uh, stages before we uh, go and elaborate upon them. So, the first stage is gray level description, which is basically uh, wherein you are measuring the intensity of light, you know, at each point in the retinal image. The second is the generation of the primal sketch, uh, wherein uh, first there are two phases here. So, first in the raw primal sketch, areas could potentially correspond to the edges and textures of the objects that are identified. Then you move on to constructing a full primal sketch, which 
which is basically you use the areas to generate a description of the outline of any objects in view. We'll uh, actually elaborate on these in much more detail as we go ahead and just giving you an overview of what really Mar was talking about. The third stage in Mar's uh, approach is 2.5D sketch. It is at this stage a description of the uh, is formed of how the surfaces in view relate to each other and also to the observer. The final stage of MAR is basically object centered is a 3D object centered description. In this stage descriptions are produced that allow the object to be recognized from any angle. So you have the object you can move around you can still recognize the object. So it forms basically a very stable object centered representation. Mar concerned himself mostly at the computational and algorithmic levels of analysis and he did not really uh, worry much about the neural hardware that might actually be implicated in doing all of these computations that he was talking about. Now let us try and elaborate these stages. Uh, you will have to kind of follow this in, in more detail uh, in order to understand this entire sequence of events. So the first step in this sequence of events is building up of a grey level description. What is a grey level description? Mar thought that colour information was processed by a distinct module. He says that the process of perception is handled by different module components of processing. Say for example, if you have to see the shape, it is a different module. If you see the colour, it is a different module. If you see uh, other depth and uh, other things they are uh, carried over by different modules. You might remember in the physiology part we were talking about the uh, different areas in the occipital lobe areas V1, V2, V3, 4 etc which were all doing different stuff. So Mar kind of uh, uh, you know is talking about something similar. He says he was actually fascinated by you know this uh, idea in uh, computer science uh, that a particular uh, larger process can be actually split into modules. So a large computation he says can be split into uh, split up and implemented as a collection of parts uh, that are nearly as independent of one another as this entire task is and he was so moved by this that it actually elevated this to a particular principle uh, which was later referred to as the principle of modular design. If you remember one of our most uh, you know earlier lectures we have been talking about this principle of modularity in great detail. Now the first stage in Mars theory is basically uh, to produce a description containing the intensity uh, of or the intensity distributions of light at different points in the retina. How is this done? Uh, this basically uh, is uh, say for example uh, the way it is done is that it is possible uh, to uh, derive the intensity of the light striking at each part of the retina because as light strikes uh, a cell in a retina uh, the voltage across the cell membrane uh, changes and the size of this change how much this uh, voltage is changing corresponds to the intensity of the light. Uh, if you remember the chapter on physiology we have been talking about uh, neural impulses and how depolarization polarization happens. Uh, it is a bit about that uh, but what you need to understand for the moment is just that uh, the amount of change that happens in a neuron in the retina is uh, corresponding to the intensity of the light that is falling upon it. So using this information you can actually uh, construct a description of you know any surface uh, with respect to whatever uh, you know intensity of light has fallen upon it. So a grayscale description basically is produced by a pattern of depolarization on the retina. So you get a description which basically contains only the intensity information of the scene or of the surface that you are looking at. Now moving to the second part the primal sketch. The generation of the primal sketch basically occurs in two parts. In the first part basically the forming of a raw primal sketch happens from the grey level description uh, by identifying the patterns of changing intensity. So in the first stage you had a, dis uh, you had, uh, a description of uh, what are the different uh, levels of intensity in the surface or in the scene. In the second level you are actually taking into account how this intensity is changing throughout the surface or throughout the scene. Changes in intensity of the reflected light can be grouped into three categories. So relatively large changes uh, in intensity can be produced by the edge of an object. Smaller changes in intensity can be caused by the parts and the texture of the object. Even smaller changes in intensity might be just uh, because of random fluctuations in the light etc. Mar and Hildreth actually they worked together and proposed an algorithm that could be used to determine which intensity changes corresponded to the edges of the objects uh, meaning that changes in intensity due to the random fluctuation could be discarded. 
this algorithm uh, made use of a technique called uh, gaussian blurring uh, which involves averaging the intensity values in circular regions of the grayscale description so basically it's like uh, you know the algorithm works upon the intensity values uh, uh, that it gets from the description and uh, this is basically done over uh, circular regions of this uh, grayscale i'll just show you a figure which uh, talks about this the values at the center of the uh, circle are weighed more are weighted more than those at the edges uh, of the circle i just in a way identical to a normal distribution so if you look at if you uh, have the concept of how a normal distribution looks it's basically uh, like a bell shaped curve uh, the highest intensity is at the center the lower intensity is kind of are towards outside by changing the size of this circle in which intensity values are averaged it is possible to produce a range of images uh, blurred to different degrees so let us have a look at this figure here you can see the main picture is the figure a uh, uh, the figure b and figure c are blurred to slightly different degrees okay Marin Hildred's algorithm really basically works by comparing the images that have been blurred to different degrees. Now, if an intensity change in these different, uh, you know, uh, figures uh, is visible at two or more adjacent levels of blurring, so for example, you blur something up to 10% and 20%, 30%, if these uh, images, uh, you know, if an intensity change is visible at two or more adjacent levels of blurring, then it is assumed that it cannot correspond to random fluctuations and must relate to an edge of the object. So you just have intensity data, you have uh, data about how this uh, pattern of intensity is changing and you can see how these computations are cumulatively telling us uh, important information about what is out there, what does the object or the scene look like. Uh, although this algorithm was implemented on a computer, there is also evidence that shows that retinal processing delivers descriptions that have been actually blurred to different degrees. So it could be kind of an evidence in support of, uh, you know, uh, the way uh, Mar was uh, uh, stipulating this process is happening. Now, by analyzing this change's intensity values in the blurred images, it is actually possible to form a symbolic representation consisting of four primitives corresponding to four types of intensity change. So how do you, uh, you know, really construct this kind of an image? Uh, say, for example, if you want to look at edge segments, uh, they should uh, represent a really sudden change in intensity. If you look at a bar kind of a thing, it basically should uh, represent two parallel edge segments, so two uh, sudden changes in intensity. A termination of any surface, say, for example, the edge of this table here uh, can represent sudden discontinuity. Also, if you're talking about a particular object which can correspond to a small enclosed area bound by changes in intensity. Say, for example, you're looking at a, uh, at a face or you're looking at, say, for example, face still has a lot of many contours. If you're looking at a picture of an orange, so it has contours inside, it's just looking like a blob. Uh, here again, you can see, you can see the flower is basically more looking like a blob uh, while uh, the steel wires at the back of it are actually more looking like edges. Uh, you can see this uh, in more clearly here. You can see uh, picture A has a lot of blobs, uh, picture B has a lot of edge segments and picture C, which is basically those wires have a lot of bars. You can see how uh, this can be used on this uh, straight lines or curved lines uh, in that sense. Now, the next step after you've got this intensity description is to transform a raw primal sketch into a description known as the full primal sketch. Just to recap, what we have done is we have done a grayscale description, then we have uh, come to a raw primal sketch, which is basically uh, formed by analyzing the patterns of changes in this intensity. Now, what we have to do is we have to move towards forming a full primal sketch. What is a full primal sketch? It contains information about how the image is organized, particularly about the location, the shape, texture and internal parts of any objects that are on view. Basically, the idea is that you will have uh, uh, some things called, uh, you know, place tokens. What are place tokens? They are assigned the areas of raw primal sketch based on grouping of edge segments, a grouping of bars, terminations and blobs. So once you have done the analysis, like say, for example, in this figure here, now would you, what you would want to do is you would want to group things together. That is what one needs to do in while forming the full primal sketch.
so basically yeah so if these place tokens then form a group among themselves they can be aggregated together to form a new higher order place token so there could be different levels at which these place tokens would uh, really appear we can understand this better by looking at this example say for you for example you're looking at a tiger and how is this analysis happening so the raw primal sketch of the tiger would contain information both about the edges of the tiger's body that is the contours but also there will be information about the edges of the tiger's stripes so the tiger is basically entirely covered in stripes but then there is also at a higher level uh, the contour of the tiger so in the full primal sketch, place tokens will be produced by the grouping of individual hairs into each of the stripes. So you'll have information about the stripes. Then uh, say for example, the place tokens for each stripe would also be grouped at a, a higher level in a higher order place token, uh, meaning that there will be at least two levels of place tokens making up the tiger. One level, which is just making up the stripes, the other level based on the stripes making up the entire contour of the tiger. Now, various mechanisms have been postulated, various mechanisms exist for grouping the raw primal sketch components into place tokens and then uh, grouping the place tokens together to form the full primal sketch. Some of these could include things like clustering wherein tokens uh, that are close to one another are grouped in a very similar, in a way very similar to the Gestalt principle of proximity. Proximity basically means that you have, uh, you know, uh, you put things that are close together in one object. Okay. Uh, Another thing would be curvilinear aggregation, which is basically that tokens which are related to each other, uh, which have similar alignments, are also uh, grouped or clustered together. Okay, say for example, if you are seeing a particular line, uh, you are more likely to see that line continuing say, uh, uh, than uh, you know breaking at different places. We will talk about these Gestalt principles in more detail as we move ahead in, in the later lectures. Now, the third stage, the third stage is the generation of the 2.5D sketch. Now, Mars' modular approach to perception basically means that while the full primal sketch is being produced, other kinds of visual information are also being uh, organized or analyzed simultaneously. For example, things like depth relations, distance information between a surface and the observer, information about whether the object is moving or you are moving and those kind of things. Now, Mars basically proposed that the information from all of such modules, distance, form, uh, uh, shape, uh, color, motion, all of these modules will be combined together to form what is called a 2.5 dimensional sketch. It is also called the 2.5 dimensional sketch because the specification of the position and the depth of the surfaces and objects is done in relation to the observer. Now, this is the view of the object in relation to the observer. That is why this is also called a viewer centered representation. Uh, an object as it is looking to me okay the image of the object that is falling on my retina this will not contain any information about the object that is not present in the retinal image okay the viewer centered image is later turned into a fully 3d object centered represent representation which we'll discuss in one of the later lectures Mar basically saw the 2.5D sketch as consisting of a series of primitives that contained vectors showing the orientations of each surface. So once you have these, uh, you know, surfaces, uh, you actually, uh, you know, can combine all of them together, and the 2.5D sketch will appear as a series of primitives that contain these vectors. Uh, you can actually uh, understand this by looking here. So if you're looking at it here, you're looking at the 2.5D sketch of a particular cube. So you can see these vectors pointing in the uh, three directions are actually telling us the direction of the surface or the orientation of the surface. Let us try and evaluate uh, this approach. Let us look back and see what Mar was talking about. Now, a lot of research has followed David Mar's theory, some of it actually confirming his proposed mechanisms, while some of them have found out some a few shortcomings. Mar and Hildreth's proposal of a primal sketch uh, being formed uh, uh, by looking for changes in intensity uh, worked very well with computer simulations, uh, computer simulations, but it could not really be guaranteed that this is the same process followed by the human visual system. You would have seen that we have been discussing in one of the earlier lectures about there could be two possible descriptions of the same outcome. Ensign Resnick 1990, they showed that the participants of their study could also use three-dimensional information instead of only the two-dimensional information that is needed to form a full primal sketch. So probably, uh, you know, in some sense, the underestimated the uh, efficiency of our perceptual systems.
Uh, however, Mar's uh, proposal of the integration of depth cues in 2.5D sketch was actually supported by experiments that were done by Young and colleagues in 1993, who basically reported that the perceptual system does process these cues separately. So, and we also make use, uh, selective use of them uh, depending on how noisy they are. So, we are actually using these, uh, you know, the perceptual system is actually using these cues, these invariant features or these depth cues uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, develop a really rich representation of the external world around us and of the objects, etc. So, this was all about David Marr's theory of perception. Uh, let us try and sum this up. Uh, we've talked about David Marr's 2.5D approach to perception. We've seen that information from the sensory experience can actually be systematically analyzed to construct a good perceptual representation of the world. By good, I mean a rich perceptual representation of the world that has all the knowledge that is needed uh, for you to uh, first uh, construct a visual representation of the world and uh, because at least Mar was not really concerned with uh, about uh, perception for uh, actions, we will not talked about that in this part. However, uh, there were uh, indeed shortcomings and gaps in linking this kind of a computational approach uh, to match human performance. That is uh, what has been found out after uh, you know uh, a lot of research conducted uh, on Mars uh, principles, but nonetheless this was a good and well-rounded computational approach about uh, visual perception. In one of the next lectures, we will talk about some other kinds of uh, approaches uh, to how visual perception is uh, achieved. Thank you.